Good afternoon, ninth grade students. Hope you have enjoyed your Monday. Uh, we celebrated with our spirit day today and you could wear a costume or an accessory. So I have on my Chewbacca attire for today, which seems kind of appropriate uh, because we're reading <clears throat> Into the Clouds. Hope you've been reading along, maybe reading ahead. We are going to begin on page 42. <clears throat> Um, really right at the top of the page, a little bit of rereading, but on page 42, here we go. By July 19th, they found a site for Camp 6, 23,300 feet up the Abruzzi Ridge. Once again, the Sherpas spent an afternoon hacking rocks out of the ice and stacking them in platforms to hold the tents. The nearest level ground lay 7,000 feet below. We now felt further removed from the common world than ever before, Houston recall. Life at home with its complications, petty annoyances, hopes and struggles seemed futile and very, very far away. Houston and Petzold had spent the day scaling the Black Pyramid, the complicated maze of steep rock and sheer ice that lay above Camp 6. By afternoon, they had reached the top of the Abruzzi Ridge and found a site for Camp 7. Above them, a gradual snow slope led to the final 2,000-foot summit cone. Most of the Karakoram was laid out below, Broad Peak, Masherbrum, and the ominous Nangaparbat. For Houston, the sight was exhilarating, like nothing else in the world. No human being had ever stood this high on K2. Houston and Petzoltz hurried back to camp, with a decision to make. The team had 10 days of food and fuel with them at Camp 6. If they decide to push for the summit, they would need at least one more camp and several more days. As long as the weather held, their supplies would last. But if a storm rolled in and trapped them high up on the mountain, they would come peril perilously close to repeating the Nanga Parbat disaster. The safe thing would have been to pack up and head down the mountain. Their goal had been accomplished. They had found a route up the second highest peak in the world. Next year, Fritz Weissner could follow their path to the top of K2. An American expedition would conquer the second highest mountain on earth, and they would have played a major role. They talked for several hours and decided to try for the summit. The next day, Houston and Petzold said goodbye to Bates, House, and Kikuli at the top of the Black Pyramid. The five men had lugged three days worth of supplies more than 1,000 feet up from Camp 6. They had intended to leave all the Sherpas behind, but Kikuli begged to come at least this far. Houston and Petzold were still a treacherous ice traverse away from their campsite, but the others had to turn around to make it back to Camp 6 by dark. They disappeared into the waning light, leaving Houston and Petzoltz alone at 24,500 feet, the two highest men on earth. And here's a picture Houston makes a steep traverse to Camp 7 with the Kakorum laid out behind him. Despite their differences, the two climbers have become solid partners over the last 10 weeks. Now they were joined by a 60 foot length of cord, the Fellowship of the Rope. They shouldered their supplies for the next three days and made their way across the ice slope. Protecting them from the abyss below were Petzolt's pythons driven deep into the mountainside. They made it safely to Camp 7 and set up a lone tent. They scooped snow into a pan to melt for drinking water and dinner. But when they went to light the stove, they rummaged in their packs and came up empty-handed. They realized in horror 
that they had left the matches at Camp 6. Houston managed to find nine stray matches loose in his pack, but there was no guarantee they would work. The first one fizzled out before it ignited the gas in the stove. The second broke off at the head when they tried to strike it. On the third try, they finally got the stove to light. It was absurd, really. A year of planning, five weeks of trekking, and five weeks of climbing had brought them within reach of the summit, and they had left something as essential as matches behind. It was such a simple mistake, like forgetting your wallet when you went out for groceries. But at 25,000 feet, you couldn't make a quick trip home. K2 didn't give second chances. The next day, July 21st, Houston and Petzold went through three more matches at breakfast. Then they left to make their attempt at the summit. They each wore four wool sweaters, flannel shirts, and windproof suits, and still the cold bit through to their skin. To Houston, it felt like ice water flowing through his bones. Petzold led the way obviously stronger. Before long, they sank to their hips in fresh powder snow. Houston started to fall behind. He gasped at the thin air, trying to pull enough oxygen into his lungs. Five, six breaths every step. He knew he was done and the doubts overwhelmed him. What if he hadn't forgotten the matches and he had had an extra day to rest? What if he had let Bates or House take his place? I struggled on, he recalled later. I, why, I do not know. For it was foolish to try to gain a few more feet, and yet something within drove me to go as high as I possibly could. When he finally stopped, he sat for a while. His medical training took over, and he took his own pulse. Even after a long rest, his heart still pounded at 135 beats per minute. At sea level, it would have been 50. They had made it above 26,000 feet with just a day's climb to go. And yet Houston couldn't move another step higher. Finally, Petzl stopped and began to work his way back to his partner. While Houston weighed a tiny speck on the broad back of the mountain, he was flooded with emotion. His entire life, he decided, had been leading to this one moment. He had come face to face with something infinitely larger than himself and failed. The conditions couldn't have been better for a summit bid, except for a few stormy days, the weather had been beautiful the entire time on the mountain, and yet they had been so easily beaten. Nature had let our puny bodies exhaust themselves in the rarefied atmosphere, he reflected later. How small indeed we were to struggle so desperately to reach one point on the Earth's surface. That night, back at Camp 7, they went through their final three matches trying to get the stove lit. The next day, without a warm breakfast, they started down the mountain to rejoin their friends and head for home. Well, I think we will stop there. And tomorrow, we will begin part two, 1939, The Hermit of K2. Chapter five, boys to men. Thanks so much, ninth grade students. Hope you're having a good day and I'll see you tomorrow.